All right, welcome everyone. Thank you all for joining. Uh, today's topic is the state of guilds and GameFi. Um, so I guess, you know, why don't we very quickly just kind of go around and uh, share like a 30 second quick intro about yourself and what you guys do. Hey, thanks for the intro. Um, yeah, my name's Leo. I work on Thief Guild. We are an avalanche-based gaming guild. We're pretty new. We just launched our protocol this month. And we are an economic-focused guild, so we are trying to build protocols around game items and game tokens. Uh, not as focused on that scholarship model that a lot of guilds do. But we'd love to support all the games here that are coming. We think Avalanche is a great place for gaming, and we're excited to see the growth of the metaverse and GameFi world. Hi, uh, my name is Beryl, uh, and um, I'm a co-founder at Yield Yield Games, looking after finance. Uh, so Yield Yield Games is uh, structured as a DAO, but we're a gaming guild. Uh, so we acquire a number of NFT um, play-to-earn assets, and uh, we lend them out to our community from emerging markets. Uh, so as of today, um, our network with our sub-DAOs, we have over 30,000 scholars. Um, yeah. Hi, I'm Sierra Sun. Uh, I'm the founder of C-Square Ventures. Um, I used to be head of listings at Huobi. I'm also head of investments, so we invest in a lot of uh, amazing guilds. And for gaming specifically, uh, we have a 100 million joint gaming fund with Gala Games um, to empower gaming industry. Um, thank you. Yeah, I'm Rich Cabrera. I'm the founder at Ready Player Dow. Um, I lead investments, partnerships, uh, and community for Ready Player Dow. Uh, we have a community of about 10,000, uh, 3,000 scholars deployed across six active games, um, and just finished a raise at around 150 mil valuation. Test? Oh. Check, check, okay, all right. Uh, and my name is Han Kao, I'm the founder of Sancta Capital. Uh, we're an early stage uh, blockchain focused uh, in investment firm. Yeah. Um, okay, great. Uh, so I'd like to just kind of really quickly start off and say like, and, and try to help everyone get on the same page and, and really understand what is a guild and, and, and how, uh, what did, how did it contribute to the rise of blockchain gaming uh, over the past year? Um, maybe we can start off with Beryl. Uh, you know, the, you guys are the pioneers of the blockchain gaming uh, guild uh, industry, and so yeah, I'd love to kind of hear how you define what a guild is and does. Right. So the scholarship model within, uh, you know, like uh, within gaming, um, has always been there before. It has not been. It's not new. So in the Philippines, for example, uh, a number of players are unable to really afford the gaming assets uh, that have been, you know, like going up in price. So one of the uh, the games that actually really started the play to earn movement is called Axie Infinity. And so uh, you need like three axes, for example, to battle with, and um, they actually cost money. So uh, what these managers do is they acquire it for the players and then they lend them out to the players um, uncollateralized, meaning say that they handle the accounts, but they don't give the, uh, the, the wallet address, right? Like the, the keys. So they can't really like run a, Run, run away with the assets, like take them out from the wallet. So what happens is they lend them out, like they lend the account out, and um, the players actually end up like playing with it. And every time that they earn in-game rewards in the form of Smooth Love Potion uh, with Axie, uh, managers actually get like a percentage, uh, kind of like a shared like uh, revenue. And so um, uh, manager, uh, the scholarship model has always been like 10 scholars, 20 scholars, 30 scholars per manager. Um, but then Yield Yield Games uh, decided to actually uh, re really like take this to scale. And we started out with like 300 scholars to a thousand and then a few thousand. And uh, we call ourselves a guild because uh, not only do we support one game, but we want to actually uh, support our players with various games and provide other forms of financial services, for example, um, later on. So there's an education component, uh, there's the lending component, and um, there's a technology um, component as well that um, we at Yield Guild Games um, offer our, our users. Does, uh, thank, thank you, Barrow. Does, does anyone have a different definition of guild? Uh, and, and does anyone do things differently? Um, Rich or I, I can uh, I she touched on the base level right what scholarships are so essentially 
uh, NFT asset lending with RevShare. But I think uh, guilds are going to start doing a little bit more than just that at a base level, especially as we move away from pure play to earn, uh, where we've seen a lot of extraction uh, from the game ecosystems and the tokens. Everybody knows what the SLP chart looks like and, and what's happening there. And I think uh, games are going to start shifting, you know, terminology is terminology, but away from play to earn to play and earn uh, and try to incentivize players and guilds to uh, recycle some of their earnings and stay within the game ecosystem. So with that, I think we're going to see a larger shift away from pure scholar revenue-based models and more towards uh, more like traditional esports teams with content marketing, top players, um, sharing you know the exciting moments of the games, content creators, um, bot, etc., as well as being investment vehicles for the broader like Web3 space. So. Uh, improving user experience of gamers trying to get into the Web3 space, promoting the Web3 space, um, and investing in some of the infrastructure behind a lot of the games and the technology needed to push the space forward. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, thank you for that. Leo, Leo any, any thoughts on your side? Um, yeah, for sure. I mean, that was a great overview um, of what the scholarship models are doing and how we're evolving. I think another place that we can take guilds is to build um, protocol-based uh, value generation. And I'm talking about you know, smart contracts, I'm talking about marketplaces, lending platforms that are a bit less labor intensive and that rely more on you know, decentralized blockchain technology to support all these games. Uh, because if you think about it, you know, the, the games want to focus on building the games, they don't want to build the peripheral technologies to support them. Uh, so I think guilds can really step up and offer those services in mass. Is that, is that something you guys are working on? Yeah, yeah, at Fief Guild, um, on Avalanche, we are a very economic-based guild. Um, we aren't gonna bring on scholars, but the value we add is the platform that we're building that games can come and leverage. For example, a marketplace, for example, lending their assets and things like that. Yeah, I mean, uh, some level of automation does seem to be warranted at this point. I mean, it, we, what we're talking about is over three billion gamers sitting on the sidelines and if we want mass adoption in a real way we've got to move away from this uh, 20 guilds uh, guild 20 scholars to one manager model right and so um, I, I definitely think that you know is something that should be coming Sierra I'd love to kind of understand um, you know you're you're on the venture side you're investing are you investing in guilds uh, if so what kind of uh, variations of guilds are you seeing on your side yeah, we, we do um, a lot of guilds investments. So we were um, uh, we invested a lot of the sub uh, sub guilds uh, at YGG, and um, Asian Eight is a uh, top Vietnam guild. A lot of regional guilds. Um, I think we'll have a really good chance to to win with uh, support from the uh, local communities in crypto, especially. Um, but we are seeing a lot of the um, tooling for guilds too. I think that's where you can um, scale with um, more qualitative and quantitative data collected from the guilds and be able to process all the data and be able to really involve with the model. Um, and um, I think that's definitely a way to help to increase more, more scholars, right? For with the help with different guilds, um, X was able to um, increase their players in like March, it was like only 20K. And then in December, it started to 2.5 million. And I think um, that um, is a great contribution of the, what skills can do for the blockchain gaming industry overall. Thank you for that. Um, Rich, you touched upon something really interesting. Uh, you, you talked about play to earn becoming play and earn. And you know, I gotta say, probably about six months ago, it, everywhere I saw, from newsletters, uh, articles, podcasts, it was play to earn, play to earn. Now, if you search for play to earn, you probably won't find anything in the last three months. It's almost as if like editors from every single publica publication went in there, did a find replace, and replaced it with play and earn. What's the reasoning for that? And you know, w w what gave the emergence to that? Yeah, I think um, a lot of it is semantics, but semantics do matter, right? Um, I think the idea is like you're, before a lot of people were coming into the ecosystem um, as extractors to come and play a game, earn money, and take it out. Uh, and I think what a lot of people have begun to realize is that that's not sustainable, right? Um, if players are coming in and mass millions of players, even if they're pulling out small percentages of the overall economy, and uh, guilds are the ones that are reinvesting into 
creating more and, and uh, building on top of that ecosystem. Eventually, there's a tipping point, uh, which we've seen with Axie and SLP and AXS and all of that, uh, where the player extraction will pass the uh, investments from the guilds and um, other players looking to build out the ecosystem. So be due to that, I think people are starting to rephrase this and say, hold on, let's take a step back uh, and send a different message. Uh, play to earn sends the message that you're there just to earn and just to pull you know, a financial incentive out of the game. Play and earn is, is kind of more of the approach of let's play this game with the potential of also earning something. So instead of coming in saying, I'm going to put $5 in and I'm going to try to take 6 or $7 out every time, it should be more, I, I want to put $5 in, I might get $3 out, but I also had a great time playing this game and I got other value that's not purely financial from it. Yeah, to make, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, it just, it just seems completely unsustainable, right? I mean, if everyone in there is playing and solely for the sake of earning, then it just, you know, it, it kind of takes all the, uh, it takes the purpose out of the game, right? And so, what are some of the different ways that um, maybe some of the guilds can speak to this? What are some of the ways that you guys are, um, I guess, uh, addressing this issue on your side? Uh, now, obviously, I think a lot of that comes from the game side and the game developers, but what are some things you guys are doing or thinking of doing to address this um, the sustainability issue. Sure, I'll touch on this briefly, and I'd also love to hear from the other speakers. But um, I think what we do at FIF is really help promote and market the fun side of a game. We don't like to just keep pushing terms like revenue and ROI. We want to promote their lore, their culture, why the game is fun, and what they're building, so that um, we get the stickiness of users that actually want to play the game for the game and not just I can make this much money per day playing this game. Uh, this is a very, very um, important point as well. Yeah. Um, so we're so like a, a YGG. What we've actually been doing is um, we've actually invested and diversified into other games as well. Um, and um, so Axie Infinity was actually the first game that actually uh, have, has it really like proven that hey, play to earn actually works. Meaning, to say that there's a niche market in emerging markets that uh, they so. Okay, the history of this was uh, when the lockdown actually hit and then co the COVID pandemic, um, you know, uh, caused governments to lock down certain like areas within the Philippines. Um, a lot of players just had to, so, so, I mean, workers had to stay at home and with an internet connectivity in the smartphone, they're able to download the game and then um, they're able to actually just like play and then all of a sudden they realize, hey, I can actually earn this in-game rewards which I could actually convert into fiat, Philippine pesos, which can actually help me provide like food on the table, milk for my kids, all of that. So it was very much like a survival instinct. But what's really fascinating about their behavior is um, it changed from okay, I never had savings in the past, I did not have work, and then now they're starting to earn, uh, you know, like um, an income level that's uh, an alternative income level that's much more than their minimum wage, right? So minimum wage in the Philippines is like $200, and um, uh, they potentially were earning more, and what happened was they were circulating these mobile phones across, you know, like um, the mother, and then um, something the child, and then, you know, um, at night, they, they do shifts. Uh, and then in the morning, it's the grandparents are actually just like using this mobile phone. And um, they were actually like, playing um, and they developed a community around it, meaning to say, okay, I'm earning money, but let's make this fun. And so what happened with Axie Infinity was they developed other forms of role, such as suddenly brokers um, emerge, like um, uh, brokers for, you know, like metaverse land. Um, emerge and then suddenly you actually have, um, uh, you know, like um, uh, various roles uh, within the community. Like esports came out, and then you actually have those social media uh, people um, coming out, right, um, showing people that they're playing um, through Facebook Live, and um, the community as well has uh, kind of like. So when they started earning, they actually had a program. Let's give it back to the community. So during the pandemic. Uh, those that actually earned money um, came together and then they were giving like porridge, for example, to the community. So it wasn't just 
okay, I'm playing because I get incentivized, but I think the success of uh, these games is actually the community behind it, the, the other roles that are being formed. It's a, an economy, right? Um, and um, what we've actually learned as well from this game is, okay, Axie Infinity might not have perfect token economics, but because it's actually the first game that has proven that uh, there is an economy around it, um, you know, we could actually improve this uh, further. And so uh, when we actually evaluate other games as well that come in, uh, you know, uh, that we're actually investing in, uh, we actually look very deeply in the economics, uh, token economics, as well as um, how our community would react with the game. Is there going to be a potential diverse economy um, around it? Uh, so, yeah. Um, so, play to earn, it's, it's, it's labor, right? And play and earn is, means that you actually enjoy the game. Um, as we're seeing like more AAA um, level games coming into the blockchain space, I think that will be able to really scale and get more users and more players in the market. Um, but I, I do agree that the token design behind everything is more important than just the model itself. I remember when we were looking at investment in Axie and also listing it, I, I do see the problem with the whole token design. It only works uh, when you have um, constant um, new users and new players into the game. It has to be a, a upwards up market. Otherwise, it kind of, it reminds me of Chainlink. The more people use it, the worse the token is doing. It's because it's a payment token. You like, that's just an example, right? You never want your token to be a payment token because that means you're like, your internal fight with your own system. The more people, um, the more users you get, the worse the token is doing. Like, you, you, people are not incentivized to, to use it as a payment token. So I, I, so I agree to the point that um, it's more with the design of the token economics and design of the token usage that it needs to have more utilities and more incentivized on how to um, get more users to use it, to stake it, or like burning system, or if it's, like, you know, it, it sounds like a security token, but maybe uh, buyback and redistribute. There are tons of ways that you can do for the token design to make it work better. Yeah. Yes, yes, this is a... Uh one of my favorite topics, but uh, tokenomics is very interesting. Um, and, and our approach is twofold at Ready Player Dow, right? One is we want to invest in games and projects that have made this realization and have thought through ways uh, to solve it. And two is we like to advise uh, the games where we can. And that's, that's why we try to keep a very close connection uh, to the projects that we invest in. Uh, and help them build out and help them overcome a lot of those hurdles that come with building a sufficient tokenomic structure. Um, and, and I think there's, there's a law, um, I, I am blanking on the name, it's not Murphy's Law, but it's like, it might be Murphy's Law, where it's the, the worst thing, you know, if it's possible to happen, it will happen, right? So if you design a tokenomic structure that allows people to extract freely, people are gonna find ways to extract as much as they can um, as they can, right? So uh, something that we see Axie Infinity is redesigning their tokenomic structure with the release of Axie Origins, uh, and they're introducing soul-bound resources, right? And that's gonna be a, preven a prevention mechanism uh, for extraction for both guilds and scholars. So it, it definitely, there is a large reliance on the games themselves and the token structure that they design um, to be designed in a way to encourage and incentivize uh, reinvestment uh, into the game and limit some of the uh, extraction that's that's possible. Thanks, Rich. Both you and Barrow both mentioned a really interesting word, uh, esports. I'd love to talk a little bit about esports and how it relates to the blockchain gaming economy and how it actually helps the blockchain gaming ecosystem. Anyone that has a strong opinion, feel free to respond to that. I personally am very new to esports, but um, I do have a team that's <laughs> crazy about esports. <laughs> so um, how I see it is, uh, like I mentioned, uh, communities are forming, and then they end up like really playing competitively, and um, yeah. So I think um, uh, 
we actually see players that actually have um, so you actually have a uh, like a rating uh, per player um, on um, how good they are and um, yeah so they create like um, communities out of it so that's how I actually see uh, esports um, there's more how do you call this like people like coming together and um, playing uh, for example Axie Infinity more competitively um, and people like watching them as well like uh, they find it like fascinating like entertaining as well Maybe you can say more about esports. <laughs> um, yeah, I think esports is very powerful. You know, I was a traditional gamer. I loved watching esports. Um, I met my favorite streamer from League of Legends, Voy Boy, last night. It was a surreal experience, so that was awesome. And what I want to point out is when we're building blockchain games, we have to think about where are we trying to pull users from, right? Are we trying to pull them in from the DeFi side, get them to just start using GameFi, or are we actually trying to pull them in from the traditional gaming side, the consoles, the PCs, the mobile games? And the latter is the harder one, right? Because there are so many steps to get comfortable with crypto, with tokens, with wallets. So a lot of these um, play-to-earn games are kind of just DeFi skin, right? DeFi with extra steps, and that pulls a lot of the, uh, you know, people already in this ecosystem over, but that's a very small pool. So we need ways to get people from the other side. And I think eSports is an extremely powerful tool for that because we have these trusted gamers that you watch on stream and you see them playing blockchain games as a, you know, like a retail player and you're like, wow, like I should actually probably try that. And you, you might take the leap into gaming, into crypto. So I, think, I see that as a powerful next step for the evolution of uh, GameFi. Yeah, yeah th that, that makes a lot of sense. As a as an investor investing into blockchain-based gaming uh, companies and, and projects, um, we initially saw esports as a too small of a niche uh, to even think about at the moment. And uh, although recently we started becoming very active investors of esports because um, we feel that the esports industry brings a sense, not just a community, but a sense of competition, uh, a sense of rivalry, and, and that affinity towards uh, a specific uh, focus. Uh, game to be specific um, and so that's definitely I think uh, in my opinion you know something that could help uh, increase engagement uh, within the uh, the ecosystem to kind of minimize that selling pressure uh, as we know it that is kind of causing uh, some of the challenges uh, that we're facing right now um, I'm, you, you know so most guilds are essentially set up as investment companies, you know, or, or uh, whether you're investing in the tokens of the games or investing in the NFTs, um, how do you guys go about evaluating the games that you're going to go and invest in? Maybe, um, well, uh, Rich, you've been quite over there, sure. maybe you can start off? Uh, yeah, I, I, like I mentioned, you know, previously, tokenomics is extremely important, um, but what's also important is, you know, is it fun to play, uh, and are they building uh, a niche digital nation? Um, so I, I had a very interesting conversation a few weeks back uh, with Peter Pan from 1KX about you know what what's going to make a game successful in the Web3 space, and our conversation kind of steered towards look, we're building an economy within the game, so it's not just a game anymore, it's more of a digital nation, right? And we hear that term a lot from Axie uh, of what they're trying to, to develop. So one of the things that you know, we like to look at is like, have you thought about as a game your, your target audience and how are you approaching building that audience and building a community from that audience? And giving them what they look for out of the games, like what's, what's your target gamer, um, how do they approach games, and then how are you designing your game to lure them in and have them engaged and uh, coming back every day and reaching towards the goals in their game. There's always an end goal or a target to reach um, in the game that you're designing as well. And then once they've achieved that, what's the next step? How are you keeping them engaged, etc. cetera? Um, so those are the, beyond tokenomics, those are the kind of things that, that we like to look for, and then obviously uh, esports and content marketing. Um, how how will we bring on new players beyond that core uh, community of gamers that's going to be there for your game as well? Does anyone here have a different way of evaluating potential uh, game investments? Uh, I'll talk about it. Um, 
So we have been really conservative with, with making um, investments in uh, vertical single games. It just um, we see a lot of uh, great teams from Web2, um, but didn't really make it. And I just don't think that simply adding a token will just be very successful. So we look heavily into the de um, token design, token economics side of the stuff, and also um, how interactive it is, the token itself. Uh, with the game, um, but we do make a lot of investment, more like a, a horizontal kind of deal in the gaming space. Um, so like DAO tooling, guilds, guilds management, um, engines, um, studios, and the the the, um, the more horizontal it is, I think it's um, the, the better chance it can scale fast in the future. Yeah, so um, a unique perspective from FIFA is we don't really invest in games necessarily, but we like to promote all games on Avalanche. And what I think is beautiful about GameFi is the fundraising aspect of these tiny dev teams, the builders, because builders are part of the gaming community too, right, that want to build games. They can get funded by launching a token and build their tiny game with their three programmer shop. And that game doesn't have to be long-term sustainable. Um, for example, there's a couple of games on Avalanche, like a cookie game that lasted what, like two weeks or something. <laughs> but it was fun, and you know people enjoyed it. No one like lost money on it because it was just a game. And to be able to support and promote that type of community, I think, is really beautiful. Cool. Um, I'd love to really quickly touch upon the metaverse. How are you guys, as guild operators, thinking about the metaverse and your role within the metaverse? Um, I, I think uh, the metaverse is very much a broader topic. Um, it's something I like to think about a lot, especially if uh, anyone knows the background to, to our name, Ready Player DAO, Ready Player One. Um, I think the Oasis is a very interesting concept of allowing, if, if you've read the books and, and you know looked at how that was designed, I know it's an imaginary world, which might not be as practical in, in the real world, but uh, allowing people to come in and build experiences, uh, whether nostalgic or, or new, um, and design a world, an escape essentially, right, uh, that they enjoy, but allowing them to do so freely uh, where it's, it's not as, uh, I think like in the Web2 space, game publishers look at how they can pull capital from their gamers to you know, build their company, right? And I don't think that's gonna be as successful as an approach for something like the metaverse uh, because people like Minecraft, for example, are going to come in and build amazing things uh, that they enjoy, um, but they don't want to feel like they're building something for someone else to get rich off of, right? Um, so I think it's going to be an interesting approach to seeing how Meta, uh, previously known as Facebook, uh, goes that direction. And we all know about BAYC and Sandbox and Decentraland. Um, and I, I think it hasn't been fully flushed out or figured out yet, um, so I'm interesting, interested to see you know, what comes to fruition over the next five years there. I, I, I almost feel like that would be a really natural extension of guilds because you guys are ultimately, in, in, in a certain sense, con um, affecting distribution of the games and the marketing of the games, right? And so I, I imagine a world where in different metaverses, they're looking for players, they're, using, they're looking for interaction. Um, you guys can s certainly just kind of redirect your scholars into different activities within those new worlds um, and allow them to be entertained in that way and, uh, and, and you know, help bring activity and life to different metaverses. Um, I don't know, I guess it's still early days. Absolutely. Uh, you know, we haven't shared this publicly, but we have a few plots of land on Sandbox that uh, Land Vault, uh, the largest metaverse land developers in Sandbox, is building out for us, and we're trying to gamify that experience. And you know, guilds at a at a high level um, are not only investment firms, but they're also community as a service, right? So, like like you said, you know, we can we can bring that community and and build on top of that. And even historically, previous to Web3 guilds, uh, if you think about how guilds acted in games like World of Warcraft uh, and other places. It was a group of like-minded individuals that are looking for a certain experience uh, in a game or we can say in a metaverse, right? 
Absolutely. And uh, speaking of community, I'd love to kind of turn to the audience real quick. And we've got a couple minutes left and see if anyone in the audience has any questions for the speakers. Yes. Why don't you uh, want to hand him a mic? So uh, thank you very much. Uh, you spoke about tokenomics uh, and about Axie. And I think my scholars agree with you that it's not uh, great currently. But uh, what is for you a game that you saw recently and that has a very good tokenomics? So the question is, what is a game that you guys have seen recently that has good to tokenomics? Yeah. I can go first on this one. Uh, my favorite game on Avalanche is Krabata. Uh, it's digital crabs that you go on mining missions with and battle each other. And what I really like is the use cases they give for the game reward token, TUS, Treasure Under the Sea. Um, it's used for breeding, it's used for marketplace sales, and most importantly, they are building their own gaming subnet called Swimmer Network, and it's the gas token of that entire subnet, and that's an open subnet, so any game that wants to build there can come build, and that's very powerful because now you're earning rewards that power your gas on the network, and that's something I haven't really seen done much before. Yeah, I, uh, I recently, like two days ago, put out a blog post kind of talking through um, incentive mechanisms for burns, uh, burning tokens. Uh, and, and I think that there's still a lot more to come with how tokenomics are approached in terms of uh, incentivizing different personality types, right? So, so not every gamer is the same. The way you might come into a game is going to be different than the way I might approach a game, right? Uh, you can, the classic examples like a first person shooter, you have someone who, you know, goes all the way in, rushes in and attacks. You have the sniper that sits back. You have the person that's more cautious, tactical, et cetera. And they're all looking for different experiences out of the games. And I think the most efficient uh, tokenomic structure is going to uh, apply to people of different personality styles. So the introvert versus the extrovert versus, uh, you know, the analytical versus the one that's just looking to have a good time. Um, these are all different types of people looking to interact with the game differently, um, you know, earn differently, spend the tokens differently, and I think uh, an efficient tokenomic structure is going to have to apply to all those types of players and individuals. So, in my opinion, like right now, uh, we can theorize uh, what is, you know, might be a good token economics and whatnot, right? Um, a lot of the play and earn games or play to earn games are um, just about to launch. So we will actually see how the market and you know, the consumers or the community actually responds to it. Um, so it's, it's still very, very new. And um, the only way to really find out which token economics really work is if it gets tested in the market. And we actually see uh, you know, uh, fr from that, right? Um, so third quarter of 2022, we're, we're going to be seeing some of these games uh, launching to market. Um, just to add on to that, um, <clears throat> um, I, I like, um, I'll, I'll not say what, 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 what project, uh, we haven't closed yet, <laughs> but, <laughs> but um, the token is very well designed uh, because it incentivizes different players in the ecosystem, not just um, the scholars, the players, also the uh, node runners, um, also the NFT owners, and the builders. So I think um, that's really good design, and it's very interesting to see that it can really engage different players in the, in the ecosystem. And also, um, another part of the token design is the distribution, right? So as the market is going to be a little quieter, um, in the, in the um, near future. Um, we'd like to see um, kind of the change of schedules for the token distribution so that when they get listed, um, they can have a flexibility of going to like fair launch, IDO, or centralized exchanges so that can be flexible with that way. Thank you, Sierra, and thank you, panelists. I think we're out of time. Thank you all for joining us here today.